Good morning. Um, our next panel will be all about entrepreneurship in Europe and the big question of should I stay or should I go? Um, meaning, what is better for my company to stay in Europe and scale it to the US or the other way around and um, found my company in the Silicon Valley and scale it from there? I would like to introduce to you the moderator of our next panel, Jennifer Schenker, who is the founder of the Informilo magazine and editor-in-chief. Jennifer, please come to the stage. Good morning. Um, if... Um, you have not uh, yet uh, seen a copy of uh, Informilo magazine, uh, which is a um, magazine about the global tech sector. Please pick up a copy on your way out when you pick up uh, your coat. Let me now uh, introduce uh, the panel. May I please ask Nicholas Brusson from Blah Blah Car, uh, <clears throat> Giuseppe Zocco from Index Ventures, and Mikael Zane from Zendesk to come up. Thanks. So, <clears throat> let me give a quick introduction to our, our panel. To my immediate right, Nicholas Brusson from Blah Blah Car. So, for those of you who are not familiar with the company, um, they uh, are a uh, intercity ride-sharing service that has 10 million members um, in more than a dozen countries. They've just launched in India a few days ago. Um, they're also present in Russia and through much of Europe. They transport more than two million people uh, every month, more than Eurostar. And in August, it received a $100 million investment from Index Ventures, Excel, and several other VCs. This followed earlier a uh, round of uh, $10 million. Um, and um, all the way on the end there, we have Mikael Zwein, another great European entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> Mikael uh, and two other Danes started Zendesk, which is a very popular SaaS-based customer service software company um, <laughs> in a loft in Denmark um, back in 2007 and uh, very quickly moved to Silicon Valley where they scaled the company globally and uh, they did an IPO on the New York Stock Exchange last May and today are valued somewhere around 1.7, 1.8 billion dollars. Um, Mikkel has just written a book called Startup Land, um, and uh, it is the story of how three guys risk everything to turn an idea into a global business. Um, if you're interested in hearing more from Mikael after the panel and knowing more about the book, uh, both he and um, another author, Alex Christie, who wrote a book called Guttenberg's Apprentice, will be doing a book discussion immediately after this panel in the Wirecard Lounge uh, right. downstairs. So um, uh, we also have on the panel Giuseppe Zocco from Index Ventures. Index Ventures um, is a venture capital firm that um, invests both in Europe um, and is also present in Silicon Valley. They invested in both Zendesk and Blah Blah Car, and um, uh, they have um, they have a pretty pretty good success rate. I think in the last uh, 18 months. Uh, you had um, eight billion exits worth a billion uh, dollars or more, and at least four of them came from Europe. So I'm going to um, I'm going to just give each of our panelists a really um, a couple of just a very couple of brief moments to to talk a little bit uh, more about what they do and who they are, and then we're going to go right into this discussion about um, as as uh, Alexandra put it, should I stay or should I go. Um, the pros and cons of scaling a business globally from uh, Europe or Silicon Valley. So, Nicholas, um, some people get blah blah car confused with Uber. Tell us, um, you know, how you differ from that company. 
Yeah, so it's a, it's a fair question, a question we get uh, <clears throat> pretty much all the time. Uh, so, so let me maybe start by saying that from a, a user point of view, actually our users don't confuse us for Uber or any taxi service, right? Uh, and probably the way to describe it is what do we disrupt as a company and what does Uber disrupt as a, as a company? So Uber, as we know, is going to disrupt mostly the taxi industry or short distance travel within a city. What we end up disrupting is long distance travel. It's city to city travel. So if anything, it would be the trains, the long distance bus. So, so as the industry, we, um, uh, we disrupt. So in a way, it's a bit comparing like a high speed train uh, and a taxi, right? So it's two, uh, two different markets. But also in the way we operate, Black Black Car is very much a community. So essentially, you join Black Black Car as a member. And we don't manage like a fleet of drivers or professional drivers. Essentially, what we do is we just foster a community. And people within that community actually are going to share their ride when they drive from, let's say, Munich to Berlin. And then they're going to take two, three, four passengers along the way and share the cost. So we've been building that uh, initially out of France. And then very quickly, and I'm sure we'll talk about that, but very quickly, we expanded all over Europe, uh, and we've built this European platform, this European transport company, and more recently, we raised $100 million to go, uh, to go global, essentially. Okay. And, and just, um, you know, I think a couple points that are interesting <clears throat> for the audience is, one of the, another difference with Uber is that, you know, basically through your community, you pick your driver, and you, you look, you know, and decide if you want to go with that person or not, and you're able to check the, their social network rating um, and figure out whether you want to go with this person or not. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's really based on the community, right? So you join that not as a driver or not as a passenger, you, jo you join that as a member, and then you end up sharing your ride as a driver or taking a ride as a passenger, uh, but then you always have a choice. So it's a, it's a two-way vetting process. Right. Okay, thanks. So now let me turn to you, Mikkel. So um, tell us uh, a little bit about um, how the focus of your company is evolving now that you've gone public. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, first and foremost, for the introduction. It's very fitting. Sendus is a customer service platform. I am Danish, thus the broken accent here. Um, but we, we built it out of a kitchen in Copenhagen, moved it to San Francisco, and have had a time of our life uh, building this company. We today have more than 50,000 businesses around the world using Sendesk. A lot of these are small businesses and fast-growing companies. Companies like Uber, companies like Airbnb, companies like Dropbox are using Sendesk for providing great customer service. Most recently, and also in connection with the IPO, we have matured. I got my little tie, and we are starting to serve much more uh, uh, mature, large enterprises. So we now serve governments, uh, for example, Gov UK, uh, the FCC in the United States. We serve big enterprises like Ingersoll Rand in the US, uh, Red Bull here in Europe, uh, and so many other companies. Okay, thank you. So, um, just me, tell us a little bit, you know, help us get the context for Index, and, you know, it uh, seems you're placing big bets on, on European companies. Um, so, tell us why you believe in Europe. Thank you, thank you, Jennifer. And actually, we're a startup. When we started in 96, the idea was to build a platform to help entrepreneurs to be as successful as possible, building their business globally, regardless of where they were based, where they are European companies that obviously go to the US and expand, or US companies help them come to Europe. And I think over time, we have seen the European ecosystem mature so much that uh, in these days, particularly in the last 18 months, you alluded to that in your opening. Uh, if we just take our example where uh, eight companies graduated to sort of the billion dollar the unicorn club. Uh, four of them were clearly European with uh, Criteo, King, Supercell, and Just Eat. And one, I think it's at least half European. I think we claim the, <laughs> the Danish roots as half European. So whether the companies stay in Europe and then they go international, whether they move in the early days like uh, uh, Mikkel has done with his team, or whether they grow in the US and then they come over here, this is becoming really a, a global platform. And the good news is that Europe now is much more fertile than it used to be. Okay, great. So I think that's a, a great segue for um, the issue of you know, raising enough funds to, to be able to scale a company globally. So um, well, let, me, let me start with you, Mikhail. I mean, because you, you actually left Europe you know, seven years ago because you, you didn't have a great experience raising money here. <laughs> so maybe you know, tell us a little bit about that and, and, and what your experience was fundraising in the Valley, and then we'll... we'll jump to Nicholas and sure. talk about it. So we moved to the U.S. in 2009, and that means that we started pitching VCs uh, during 2008. Uh, and that was a relatively tough year. That was the year of the credit crunch. 
It definitely didn't make it easier. But the, the, the reality was that there was very little money to raise in Europe. I know that it's different today. I know there's a bunch of large funds and so on. But back then, it was almost impossible to raise money. Um, then going to the U.S. and starting pitching there was a completely different experience. Suddenly we were welcomed. We had a much larger uh, audience to talk to about raising money. Uh, and we're also successful in raising both our Series A and right after that our Series B and moved the company to uh, San Francisco. Okay. Um, now, Nicholas, you, you know, have been able to raise um, well over $100 million dollars being headquartered out of France. Um, so, you know, this, this is kind of a relatively new phenomenon in Europe. Tell, tell us a little bit about, you know, the fundraising experience here. Yeah, and I think it, you know, clearly it has changed uh, since 2009 and in the last 10 years. I mean, it clearly it has improved a lot in Europe. But for us, I mean, we've done that in steps, right? So the, I mean, the first step really was 2010, when we had like a, a Series A or seed round of like 1.2 million euro, which was really like, building the company in France, proving, not even the business model, like proving the activity. Then we had another step, actually, end of 2011, uh, which was $10 million from Excel Partners. Uh, and back then it was really, okay, can we go European? So the big bet was, can we transform this French company into a European company? And in a way, we've been pretty successful at doing that between 2011 and 2014. And in 2014, it became much easier to go and raise $100 million but not as a French company, really, even though we HQ'd in France, but as a European company. So we could say, we are number one all over Europe. Now we want to go into Russia. We want to go into India. We want to go global, essentially. So, so I think it's possible to raise that amount of money, not as a French hq company, but as a European player, you know, as a European leader. Uh, so we've done that in steps, and today it's possible. And I guess what's even more interesting is it's possible to do it without being in the US and without going to the US and without pitching a story going into the US. Uh, and, and today you have investors both in Europe and in the US, so we arise from a mix of European and, and US investors that now understand that, right? Because they see what's happening in all the emerging markets, they see what's happening in Europe, and you can really pitch a story saying, well, actually my own market is Europe, I'm going to go global, I might go to the US, I might not go to the US, uh, but the market is big enough and we need $100 million to do that. And, um, and today it's possible. I think five, ten years ago, it would have been pretty, pretty tricky. So it's clearly moving pretty fast and moving in the right, uh, in the right direction. So, so what do you advise your companies? I mean, it, do you, would you say that like, if they're in the B2B space, um, is the US single market still you know, a, bigger, a, a better place for those companies to start? And are there more consumer-oriented opportunities here? Well, I think, as Enrico was saying, you know, the important thing is to have a global ambition from the get-go and to structure your company team and, and the skill set uh, with that in mind. And so wherever you are based in the beginning, the early days are really just about assembling the team, crystallizing the vision, and, and launching the company. And then, you know, entrepreneurs are so resourceful, they'll go wherever the business needs them to go. We have noticed that if you're particularly in the enterprise business, you may have a little bit of an advantage being in the valley because the talent is more abundant. You have customers and suppliers of, of, of talent as well as, you know, customers for your product close by. Uh, but for consumer businesses, for example, since the days of Skype and, uh, you know, a number of mobile-based platforms, for example, like King and Supercell and what Blah Blah is doing, what Funny Circle is doing, shows that a lot of these companies can actually grow from a European base as long as they have global ambitions. It is very important, I would say, early on to go into the U.S. market to occupy the territory so that there is no uh, U.S. player that comes back and, and sort of eats your lunch. Um, and in some cases, just like what Mikkel has shown, is if you, if you transplant your team early on, then you can benefit from that growing market. So I would say there is no one recipe, but it's important to understand where your talent is, where your customers are, how easy it is to build a team. And by the way, in the Valley, there is more talent, but it's a little bit more competitive, so people tend to hop from company to company. In Europe, there is more <laughs> stability in the, in the talent pool. So there are pros and cons, and I think we've seen great teams succeed on both sides of the Atlantic. <laughs> So, so one of the cons of, of, of building um, in Europe uh, is, is this whole idea of, um, you know, there's, there's 25 different markets. And, 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 and this is something that, you know, Michael, you might want to talk about a little bit, just this whole idea of, you know, you have to deal with uh, 
different regimes and every market. And, and is that one of the reasons why you decided not to stay? No, I, I don't think that has anything to do with that. Like, there, there is a, there's a mentality in Silicon Valley. And, and I, like, for every entrepreneur out here who haven't visited Silicon Valley, I will encourage them to visit San Francisco and Silicon Valley and suck up some of that vitality and inspiration and energy there is there. Because, yes, there is a lot of people jumping from one company to the other, but, but that's because there's so many sexy opportunities out there. You that's know, right. it, it is a very inspirational place with fantastic companies building amazing things, and, and it's all within like a 40-mile radius, you know? So you have everything right there in front of you, and you get so inspired. And I think that was... Okay, we raised money in the U.S. because we had a hard time raising money in Europe. But we also learned so much from coming to the U.S., from coming to Silicon Valley. Like, in Denmark, we were considered like three guys in a room with a computer. And that was very cute, you know. Oh, are you sitting there with your computer? Like, we come to California, and suddenly, like, they're looking at us as, okay, you can you can go out and disrupt the entire enterprise software space. And we're like, okay, <laughs> let's do that. That sounds a lot funnier than the other thing. Um, and that like that there is no ceiling, that you can dream as big as you want to, and, and people can actually help you execute on those dreams. Getting that inspiration into your DNA, into your company, is just, it's, it, it, it's what takes it from just being a startup to being this next generation company. So I think that I, so I wanted to ask you, Nicholas, because you actually spent time in the valley. Um, you worked there, um, but then you decided to come back to Europe and build a global company from here. Um, what what led you to do that? Yeah, so so I've gone the other way. I've gone the wrong way. I just <laughs> I went from Silicon Valley to Europe, which is a weird thing to do. Uh, no, but it's true. I mean, the, the DNA point, actually, Mikkel mentioned, is true. I mean, for me, I started, actually, my first job. So I finished my studies in Silicon Valley. I got my first job in Silicon Valley. And I ended up in a company where we raised $85 million. So it was during 99, 2000. We raised $85 million. We wanted to conquer the world. We've burned all the money. We went Chapter 11 after two years. But you, you learn a lot, right? You learn on the way up. You learn on the way down. Uh, and clearly, that, that level of ambition did not really exist in Europe back in 99 and 2000. Um, I think today it has changed, right? So, so today you see, A, you see European entrepreneurs that actually spend some time in the Valley. So I spent seven years there. Um, Fred, actually, as a co-founder, spent two or three years there, uh, get to Stanford. Uh, so you know, as a team of co-founder, co we have like 10 years actually in Silicon Valley, right? So, so in a way, we bring that DNA into, uh, into a European company. But, but it's not only that. I think the, the, the thing we've been missing in Europe in the last 10, 15 years, and, and it's changing now, is that especially on the consumer internet, the issue is not the market, right? If you look at e-commerce, food delivery, hotels, what we do, like transport between cities, the market in Europe is as big or bigger than the US. So it's not like a, a market problem. And even US companies, when they get into Europe, they don't think of one single market. They think of all of that as a, uh, you know, as a complete European market. I think the issue is like, how do we address Europe as a market on the challenge of you know, becoming a European company? Uh, and for us, it, it's been like for the last three or four years, actually, it's been like a big DNA change where you ask co-founders, you need to hold the line and say, okay, we're going to be a European company. Our market is Europe. We're going to be in every market in Europe. Uh, uh, you know, and we need like local teams in every country. So today we have nine teams, actually, uh, out of Black Black Car. And then you, you sort of push that ambition to your team, then to your investors, then you can raise more money, and you, you can create that momentum actually from Europe, but uh, it is, and then you can go global. But it is incredibly expensive. Like, it is incredibly expensive uh, uh, setting up operations in Europe. Like, you have to have legal entities in every country. You have to deal with local labor laws. Thank you very much, Germany. Um, <laughs> you have to deal with, like, taxes. I know that VAT is... So the last thing you think about in the night and the first thing in the morning. Uh, like, you have to deal with all these different uh, uh, things. And, like, Europe as a whole is, like, impossible to scale. But it, when, you, when, when you start from France, everything looks simple after that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, we, so, so it, 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 every company set up was simpler. So. <laughs> and I think just to build on that point, I think Mikael said something which is important, which is the mentality of building a company globally is something that really Silicon Valley has honed over the years. And a lot of our European entrepreneurs, we say, you know, you have to either be there. A lot of our partners have studied or worked there, and you have to go there, and there is this entrepreneurial mosquito in the valley that punctures you and gives you this entrepreneurial DNA, and you have to be infected with that way of thinking, which is, you know, be global leader, be ambitious. That's very important wherever you are. Yes. 
Absolutely. So, uh, Nicholas, tell, talk a little bit about, you know, beyond having the entrepreneurial spirit, you know, how, how did you break this problem of, like, you know, just building a national champion and then going to the next country and, you know, it's an lo- expensive, long process. You, th- you proved that it's easy to... S- or not easy, but it's possible mm-hmm. to scale um, quickly. And, and how, how did you do it? Yes, yeah, so, so, I mean, the first thing is to do it early, right? So, so, so we did not, like, prove the business model of Blah Blah Car. Blah Blah Car was still very much under the radar. Actually, and we were already in Spain, expanding into Italy, acquiring a company in Poland. Uh, and we've done that, so we've done that early. So that's the first, I guess, the first recipe. Um, and the, you know, when we raised $10 million, actually, three years ago, it was a bit surprising to people, right? It was still a lot of money, just like 100 million is surprising today. But, uh, but, but in a way, it was sort of like the way to fuel that ambition. Then the way we've done it, actually, uh, and maybe it applies more to Black Black Car than any other business, because we end up being like a multi-local community, even though we end up global, at the end, it's a domestic service, it's domestic city-to-city transport. Um, we've done that by acquisition. So today, as a company, a very young company, uh, we've done five acquisitions already. We'll do probably a lot more acquisitions uh, this year and next year. And, and that's how we get into Italy, that's how we get into uh, Russia, that's how we get into Poland and some other countries. So, so what we've done is we've done this acquire hiring strategy where we find the best team locally and we decide instead of building, actually, it's, it's going to go faster to convince this team to join Blah Blah Car, to acquire this company, bring the team on board. and. Um, and that's been pretty successful for us, essentially. And to give you a measure here, uh, 50% of the member growth of Blah Blah Car today comes from these aqua hires that we've done in the last month or years. Okay. So Zendex is kind of proof that, like, there isn't any one rule, right? There's different, different approaches. And for your business, you know, you said in the beginning you decided to focus, laser focus, on the U.S., market and then only then later go on? No, I think we built the company out of San Francisco and very focused on building like a strong team out of San Francisco. But already from day one, we've had customers all over the world. Even today, like we have more than 30% of our business in Europe. Um, and we serve, we serve the European market through local entities, but a lot, a lot, of, the, a lot of our operations in uh, Europe are located in Dublin, Ireland, where we have a very, we're very successful in attracting talent from all of Europe to work out of Dublin. And Dublin has become kind of this, you know, uh, uh, pit stop between uh, Europe and US today. But we have an organic model where our software is self-serve, our customers come to us through the website and, and start using the software in themselves. And it's not until we have a certain penetration and maturity of the market that we then put people on the ground that can help further penetrate in the market. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we're uh, just about out of time, so I'm going to give you the last word as an investor in these two companies. You know, what, what, does, what does the success of these two companies say about um, Europe's ability to build unicorns um, either in Silicon Valley or in Europe or anywhere else in, that, in the world for that matter? Well, first of all, I'd say these are two examples of great entrepreneurial talent who wanted to succeed and in one case, you know, went to the US, in the other case, homeland in, in, in France and then globally. And I think today we can say that if you take Silicon Valley, you know, the 40 miles around Stanford, that's a unique place. But the rest of the world is very similar. So London and New York and Paris and Boston are now very similar hubs. And I think if you have a good team with high ambition level and a good skill set, Wherever you are in one of these hubs, you have a good chance to be, to be a global leader if you're dedicated enough. And obviously in the Valley, it's a little easier, but it can be possible in all of those. And there are many examples of this uh, around the table in the room here. Okay. Um, and with that, I'd like the audience to please give a nice round of applause to our panelists. Thank you very much. Okay.